So hello everyone and welcome to this year's second LA STEED and YSI webinar series on science, technology, innovation and development policy experience in Latin America and the Caribbean. This event is a collaboration between us, LA STEED, which is the Latin America and the Caribbean STI and Development Discussion Group, uh, which is mentored by Professor Clarita Perez and the Young Scholars Initiative from the INET. My name is Arthur Moreira, PhD student at SPRU, University of Sussex. And today we have the pleasure of having the former president of the Brazilian Development Bank, Luciano Coutinho, live from Brazil, to discuss academic theory, policy and politics, a personal experience. Before I pass the word to Calota and to Luciano and properly introduce them, here's the agenda for the day and some bits of information. The conversation between them will take around 50 minutes and will be followed by 30 minutes of a question and answer session between the audience and them. Um, a few words about our group. The LAST discussion group started as a face-to-face, -face, but now is an online series of meetings that started in Spru in 2018. And this is a space where people are invited to give a talk about the concrete experience in the design and implementation of STI and development policy. So by analyzing and contrasting those experiences to see what works, what doesn't, we aim at deriving lessons for future interve interventions in the region. <laughs> Our motivation comes from the perception that interactions between policy and academic spheres are still very weak. So more knowledgeable civil servants and policymakers with great skills and competence are necessary for the state to lead the way out of the climate emergence and other societal challenges and towards a better socioeconomic outcome. So if you want to stay tuned, make sure you are receiving emails from our group. You can subscribe to it by writing to LA Steep with P. That's our uh, previous name, lastipgroup at gmail.com. You can also join our group on LinkedIn and you can go to lalix.org and go for our tab there for the previous materials. And as I said, this is a collaboration with the YSI, the Young Scholars Initiative, which is a community that supports activities organized by young scholars in various themes that show in common a challenge of mainstream economics. There are different working groups which focus on various themes. And if you check them, you see that it's not made only for economists. So everybody is welcome. And if you join, you can even suggest uh, your ideas for organizing events, perhaps close to you in your region. Our working group is called Economics of Innovation. And you can go to YSI if you haven't yet and, and subscribe and enjoy that specific group to receive more news about these events and, and other ones. The next event, for, for example, is going to be in a week from now with Mariana Matsukato, the founding director of IIPP on the 25th of May. Some suggestions. Um, I'll be keeping a list of the order of people who want to ask questions. So you can either type in your question or, or just um, so, uh, put your name so I can control the order. And if you don't want to, to ask the question yourself on your microphone, you can just tell me and I'll do it for you. Uh, I ask you also to please keep your phone muted unless you are speaking. And that's pretty much it. So let me introduce today's speaker. The main focus of Luciano Coutinho's academic career has always been industrial policy and the real economy. He holds a PhD in economics from Cornell University, a master's degree in bachelor's. Oh, no and a bachelor's uh, from the, in economics from the University of Sao Paulo. He has been a guest professor at the Universities of Sao Paulo, 
Perry 13, Texas, and Institute Ortega and Gasset, besides being a tenure professor at the University of Campinas. Um, an expert in industrial and international economics, he wrote and organized several books, besides an extensive list of articles published in Brazil and abroad. In 1994, he coordinated the study on the competitiveness of, of Brazilian industry, a work involving almost 100 specialists who mapped out the Brazilian industrial sector with unprecedented thoroughness. I think your your mic is uh, reverberating, Lucian. I'm not sure. Uh, between 85 and 88, he was executive secretary for the Ministry of Science and Technology and took part in the structure of the ministry. While there, Cochin was also involved in conceiving policies addressing high complex areas such as biotech, IT, fine chemistry, precision mechanics, and new materials. He was a partner at RCA Consultores, acting as a consulting specialist in competition defense and foreign trade before taking office as the president of BNDS in 2007. Coutinho has worked on implementing the production development policy, PDP, with the objective of carrying out the expansion of the Brazilian industrial sector, the advancement of innovation and competitiveness, as well as the implementation of infrastructure works with the Federal Government's Growth Acceleration Plan, the PAC. So thank you for being with us, Luciano. If you're still there, actually, I don't know if you, you seem to have disappeared, so we'll fix that. And discussing with Coutinho is Professor Carlotta Perez, honorary professor at IIPP UCL and Spruce Sussex and adjunct professor at the Ragnar Nurse School at Tautec, Estonia. She's the author of the book Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, one of the three books for the century in economics according to the Foreign Affairs. She has been sharing this meeting since the beginning, five years ago. So thanks a lot for that, Carlotta. It takes a lot of time for, from her and from us. So. The floor is yours, and I'll mute myself. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Luciano, for accepting this invitation. It's very, very important for us to listen to people like you. Uh, as Arthur said, this group has been meeting uh, for five years now, almost every month, with some, some breaks in between due to COVID or whatever. And uh, what we're trying to do is to make a strong connection between current students of uh, innovation policy or, or masters in public administration as in IIPP or in other areas that are very important for development. So uh, we were thinking originally of Latin American students, but gradually we have been incorporating people from Africa, from Asia, developing people interested in development, but basically interested in the link between policy and university. I think we need, even if people stay in their academic space, many of them forced to write in English because otherwise they don't go up in the, in the scale, um, we need the contact. We need to know what it's like to be in the policy world itself, in politics or policy. And uh, these people that we have the privilege to listen to, to interview, uh, have that experience and they can tell us both what it's like and perhaps allow us to have a link in the future. So when people graduate, they don't disappear into an academic niche but they actually maintain the contact. So again, thank you very much, Luciano, for accepting our invitation. And uh, I'd like to begin with your beginnings. I mean, I know you were quite young when you were given the top role in the ministry. I mean, a top role, like I understand being very, very young, you were like almost the equivalent of a deputy minister or that's what it was. Uh, 
in that Ministry of Science and Technology, which was brand new. Uh, my question is, what's the trajectory that got you there? How did you get to that post? What happened before? Well, <clears throat> first, let me thank you, Carlotta, for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to, to have this kind of interchange with young uh, scholars and uh, exchange the experience of have been in government or executive positions and how how the two things communicate. Um, I was um, quite young when I finished my, my PhD and I got back to Brazil. And by coincidence, I got involved with the Brazilian democratic movement, which was the main front of parties uh, in the opposition to the military dictatorship. And this big movement uh, needed some political and some particular, not just the political uh, uh, cause, but also an economic program, social and economic program. And that's how I got involved uh, in, uh, in contributing as a young professor at Unicamp to the preparation of such studies and such programs. And because of that, uh, when the, the new democratic government took office in early 1985, I was invited to participate. And, and they gave me some options. And one of the options was to help to organize and create a new ministry for science and technology. That's how I, I got involved. I, and I was a, uh, a young, um, I think I was 35 or 36 years old. And um, I was a direct aide to the president of the democratic movement, a old politician, Ulysses Guimarães. That's how I got involved, and and that's how I uh, had the, this challenging task to organize and create a new ministry, and then to become the the, the executive secretary of the meeting, which was number two in the ministry hierarchy, and I had this very uh, exciting. Uh, role to not just to organize the whole uh, structure and institutional uh, uh, arrangements for the ministry, but just also to discuss the strategy for the future. And in discussing the strategy, I had earlier an opportunity to interact with Celso Furtado in a commission that prepared the studies and we uh, i was in charge of writing the science and technology chapter and furtado had reviewed the chapter and we had very close interaction not just for that study but also for industrial policy etc that's how i got involved and I, I should say that it, that was a very rewarding experience for me as a young a scholar, a young uh, professor, to, to, uh, to go into an executive position in the government. Hmm. Well, thanks. That, that is amazing. And in fact, I know from my own experience, because I was a policymaker trying to do policy in Venezuela, that you were very successful in that post, so much so that all the technology policy people in Latin America looked up to Brazil, actually looked up to you. So which would you say were the main achievements and what were the key reasons for the success? Well, um, I think the achievements was, uh, uh, first of all, is was putting the science and technology policy in the 
uh, center of a government uh, strategy and also try to uh, integrate the science and technology policy with the uh, ministry, other ministries, but particularly the Ministry of Industry, but not just that. No, I had to interact with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of, uh, of Defense, uh, that at that time was separated in three set different ministries, but all the, of them had, had uh, uh, technological programs. So it was a challenging uh, 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 institutional creation. And I think we succeeded in having the policy. Uh, I, I'm, I, sh I shall uh, point out that we had also a very tough uh, uh, part in that job, which was the informatics policy at that time. Brazil had a market reserve for nationally owned firms. There was a lot of opposition to that policy. Uh, Brazil uh, had at that time a, a emerging uh, industry in software and hardware. Uh, there were, but Brazil was very good in banking automation because of very high inflation. Banks needed to be very advanced in. Uh, electronic transfer of funds, etc., and they did develop. In fact, Brazilian banks at that time, mid 80s, were more advanced if we compare with uh, other banking systems because of the informatics uh, companies. And the largest informatics companies were belonged to the to the big banks. So we had, but. However, that was a very controversial policy, and it, uh, I had to be directly involved in that too. So it was a challenging, was a very interesting, and was, uh, I remember that uh, uh, when you were in public uh, office, problems come every day, mm -hmm. and the urgency of those problems are so overwhelming that uh, you got to be prepared so you have no time to uh, relax and read and think about you got to decide and you got to take the initiative to be in power requires you to take initiative all the time and that is uh, what I started to learn, and that is part of the experience to be in the top. Not necessarily when you're not in the top and you're not uh, the person or, or, or the uh, small number of people that take the decisions, you can have some peace, but it's not, it's not usual when you're in government, when you're in, in executive position. So it, it is. Now, the important point is that if you have a good background, theoretical, if you have a good intellectual background, uh, it, it is uh, very important because you can always rely on your own understanding about the strategy and about the public interest to guide your decisions. So I think that's the importance of the academic background in the combination of the, how the academic background is so important for you to have the clarity of vision for decision making. I think this is the critical point. Hmm. And I remember because I, I went to give talks a couple of times during your tenure that you had employed people from SPRU and from very from the innovation technology community, the technological innovation community, and that 
possibly made a difference, I suppose. I remember it was very, everybody was super active. There were fantastic people supporting you. So is, yes. would you say that that was important, that you yeah. employed? Because you, you surrounded yourself with lots of people who also... Hmm. Yes, that, that is uh, obviously important. And for me, in the case of the Ministry of Science and Technology, that was, you know, uh, uh, essential to have people from academia to support the policies because the policies were uh, organized towards developing strategic technological uh, projects that required scientific support. So you got to have the people from academia very close. And that's why we enlisted a number of people to have in the ministry uh, the, that kind of support. So we had, we had a very uh, uh, highly qualified team, not just for the, the scientific area, but also for the policy uh, uh, the policy making, the policy uh, uh, planning and execution. So we had the same in the uh, much later when I took uh, the presidency of BNDS, the Brazilian uh, Development Bank, the same. Huh? I, uh, I was very uh, conscious of the importance of having a, a people from the academia. One, uh, uh, I had João Carlos Ferraz to be the planning uh, director for the bank, but also we tried to attract all the people from the academic uh, circle. And uh, they were extremely important to the bank because they could enrich the vision. The bureaucracy of BNDS is a particularly highly qualified bureaucracy and is a kind of a bureaucracy that puts value on the academic life. And what we did was to, to promote this interaction, you know, was to uh, in a very conscious way to have uh, either through consulting contracts or through the direct participation of the leadership from the academic area and also for the promotion within the bank of academic and intellectual activity. So there was a whole uh, um, uh, interest in stimulating uh, the staff of the bank to publish. We had publications. We, uh, uh, again, started to study and produce technical papers with an academic background for uh, the, the Brazilian economy, not just for sectors, but also for particular policy issues. And I think that interaction is key in the case in certain areas of government, but particularly for a development bank and for some ministries. I would say today, almost all ministries, all government need to have uh, uh, the support of ideas, support of uh, uh, strategies that were based on solid, academic knowledge. Otherwise, it just is condemned just to repeat the same without any creation, without any uh, 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 novelty and any vision for the future. I think that's, that's the big contribution of academic activity for government. But there are a few years between your original experience in the Ministry of Science and Technology and then your presidency of the BNDES. Why did you leave the government in, in 89? And what did you do in between? 
I, I did not. Uh, you you left the Ministry of Science and Technology in 1989, right? And it was several years before you became president of BNDES. So what was in between? What did you do? Why did you leave the ministry? And, and what did, did you do in those years? Well, I left ministry after four years. It was the end of a cycle. It was the end of a cycle, beginning of a new government. Uh, election of uh, Color de Mello and the different, completely different vision uh, was the start of a liberal kind of a policy and had nothing, no, no didn't match when any of my ideas. So I left and went back to the university. And then when I got back to BNDS, it was uh, a long period because Brazil had a uh, uh, different governments that I, I could not find myself in tune with these strategies uh, because of a dominance of a more neoliberal ideas or uh, there was no priority for industrial policy. There was some priority for scientific and technological policy, but divorced from from the industrial policy, so I didn't, and I didn't. Uh, uh, first of all, I wasn't invited, and second, I didn't uh, feel myself any kind of identity with these uh, in, in this period. I was again invited in the beginning of President Lula's administration, then but I refused because it was not a position that was... And then in the second term of President Lula, when he invited me to, to be the president of BNDES, I did accept, and I think was a right decision. And we, I had a very long tenure in the bank, and I spent nine years as president of the bank. I was, uh, the, uh, I think, the longest serving president uh, uh, at the bank. But you didn't tell us what you did in between, which I think is quite important as far as I know, because you actually set up a consultancy company and you learned a lot about Brazil, no? Which well, probably that, was very useful for your well, in that period, we, we, I did many things. Well, I think one important thing was a very important study that we did together, Unicamp and UFRJ, UFRJ, uh, with, in this case, was uh, with uh, myself and João Ferraz, uh, the study of the competitiveness of the Brazilian industry that was uh, in 1990 to 1992 was a landmark study uh, that went through sectors and uh, horizontal policy issues. It has generated a lot of publication, had an impact in the academic world, but not an impact to government. I went to the president and gave him the, the publications, but it, it, it had no, no president at that time uh, that was mentioned was Fernando Henrique, but he didn't, in fact, uh, gave attention to these. Uh, but that was an important uh, uh, contribution. Uh, and I started later in the 90s, late 90s, the consulting company that became today the largest Brazilian consulting, economics consulting company. And, and fortunately, it, it, it's doing, continued to do very well. It was already an important company uh, before I took office in BNDS, but uh, it, it remained so and grew and I, I'm very proud that I could also uh, had this uh, experience as a as a business. When you acquire this position, and you have a small company at that time, nevertheless you have to pay the wage bill each month. 
So you got to have revenues and you got to have a commercial policy. It's not just producing uh, organized uh, knowledge, practical knowledge. I think the consulting company has this uh, 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 advantage that it forces you to uh, dive into the real business situations and produce practical uh, 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 policy support for, for business. And so that is uh, also a, a important uh, uh, background that you need uh, that it helps also pretty much to have the academic background. So in, you cannot never abandon the academic life. Uh, I, while I was at the Ministry of Science and Technology, and then I went back to the university, of course, but when I went to also uh, dedicate uh, a, a part of my time to the consulting, you got to, and then after in the NDS, that consumed me 10, 12 hours a day, but nevertheless, during the weekends, we got to dedicate, we got to maintain a minimum academic and intellectual life to refresh your knowledge and to keep up with the main trends. You cannot forget uh, that you're to feed your own uh, academic thinking and reflection. Uh, in order to, to be capable to renew yourself the, from this point of view. And I think this is the key thing that uh, make, I think, make an academic, gives to the academic a particular, particular advantage, which is this kind of training to read to get informed, and not just that, to think about. And on the other hand, have this practical mind and the policy mind and mix things, enrich your way of, of, uh, of viewing and looking to the future. So I think this is the, 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 the key point. Mm. Yes, I guess you had sort of a triple background. You had your government experience, you had your academic theoretical thinking experience and all that, and you also made this enormous study of, of Brazilian industry, which made you know exactly who you were going to help when you got to BNDES. So, so it, you were really super privileged in terms of what you had behind your, your yes. strengths. That's so true. what do you think? Are you, sorry. No, that study required us to meet almost everyone in the Brazilian and visit companies. So it gave me a, a real knowledge, not just a theoretical, not just abstract knowledge, but the real knowledge of the problems of business in all the industrial areas. It was very rich and very important. Yes, there is something that worries me about some of the research being done now which is actually in the air, just reading or, or numbers, data, etc. Very little actual interviews, which used to be a very strong tradition in SPRU and various, you know, to really talk to business people and find out what's going on and to the engineers in plants and the whole, that, that connection, I think, is a very important one that academia needs. So I don't know if you agree with that, that... Mm -hmm. It, that it is important. But I wanted to also ask you what you consider your main achievements in the bank. What would you say? Well, the... um, I think the main achievements in the bank um, first was uh, to, to prepare and to start move the bank towards a long-term strategy. I think was one of the main tasks in the beginning was to recover 
the capabilities of the bank to form not just formulate but to start to execute long-term policies for infrastructure for industrial development for and also to face new challenges uh, one more important new challenge was the science and technology and the direct contribution of the bank to supporting science and technology the bank uh, at that time invested a very slim uh, proportion of its disbursements to science and technology into into r d so one important thing was to drive the bank and not just drive the bank but to show to the staff how important that uh, uh, drive uh, was at that time a second was to introduce this the uh, environmental sustainability and energy sustainability so support for renewable energies the Amazon challenge, etc. Those were not policies that were uh, within the mainstream of the bank and took us a, a lot of persuasion and discussion to put these in the main strategy of the bank. So those were uh, achievements that we did develop along the years but the start of this was critical from the beginning uh, in practical terms uh, just one and a half year after i took i took the presidency uh, the, the there came the great financial crisis of 1980 failure of uh, lehman brothers in october 15th of 1985 uh, uh excuse me 19 uh 2008 not 2008 uh and then um we had this challenge to face and i think the bank at that time period was critical because we could support additional investment additional capital formation in the brazilian economy equivalent to two percent of gdp in 2009 so we were the key force behind the anti-cyclical effort made by the brazilian government it was not a direct fiscal support but a financial long long-term finance support to to capital formation through long-term projects particularly infrastructure oil and gas and industrial development related to so that was an achievement because the, it was a very successful anti-cyclical policy uh, of course the global crisis didn't vanish the global crisis developed into the europe and european crisis the crisis of the euro uh, in uh, the crisis of the the the, the perspective of uh, of a default of greece in in 2011 so we had the great 2009 2010 we then got back to face other challenges of the crisis but it kept increasingly difficult to face a, this kind of crisis because it's a long term is a structural crisis global crisis but i think the important lesson was how a development bank could be a a very powerful and very useful tool for a government to to support the macroeconomic policy let's in short bnds had macroeconomic relevance because of its of its size so uh, uh, of course the bank shrunk today to one third or less but at that time we were capable we, of course we had the very 
uh, critical and very relevant support by the president himself, was President Lula at the time, that could allow us to, to, to enlarge our, our support for capital formation. But that was, uh, a, 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 I think that was a great achievement. Besides the other achievements that I, I have already mentioned, so definitely that's that's a major transformation. I was just wondering because I know that you had to deal with the people who were already in the bank, who were very knowledgeable and experienced. But that's one type of experience in the in in the bank itself. And then you brought in some academics. So I was wondering how you managed those because i'm sure there were conflicts between what the original ones the ones that were in the bank before thought were viable even your ideas about you know funding r d or funding small companies or funding i understand you also funded the poor areas in brazil which probably the people in the bank i don't know but i suspect that they thought that the poor areas were not their their space so you had this whole change you had some academics and you had the original how did you handle that was it well, difficult <laughs> what were your principles to do it properly you were successful so you must have done it right well for, i think for one thing the staff of the bank is a very is highly qualified and very and we had at that time a group of uh old Old, uh, older people that were very experienced and had a tradition more, uh, but they had, let's say, they didn't yet had the understanding of the importance of uh, technical change, the importance of, uh, so, uh, of environmental sustainability. They didn't have that so clear. Uh, and that's why the, extra, the planning mobilization for planning and the exercises and a very intense dialogue uh, not just with the uh, top of, of the staff directors and, and managing directors that we had to interact almost daily but also to create a, a, a mobilization process to discuss uh, with uh, lower ranks uh, of the bank, uh, the departments, the, the sectors. So we had to organize uh, a, 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 not just a top-down kind of planning, but bottom-up. So it took us a lot of time to discuss and to persuade and to uh, help people including the incentive for people to go back to the academics, to, to, to move, create the incentives for moving. And we did have a program to send our staff for courses abroad, not long term, but you know, uh, shorter periods, to have this new oxygen of discussion within the bank. And I think that's the, the critical contribution that the, the, the staff that we brought from the, uh, our colleagues in the academic institutions to the bank was so important. So to, to this renewal of the uh, uh, mindset of the bank, I think that was also uh, uh, because we had also a renewal of people that were retiring for age or for uh, 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 time for retiring for newer uh, staff and younger that we had also to mobilize them so do i think that was a great how important the 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 the, the process of not just planning, but managing the bank in a, in a uh, opening up to, to participation uh, of, of, uh, of the young people 
And I think that was very important also for the band. You know that every PhD thesis in this area and every academic article ends with policy recommendations. What do you think is the main difference between suggesting policies as an academic and designing and putting policies into practice from top jobs and governments? I mean, what, what do you think would be the main lessons you learned about exercising power in, in that area? Well, I think in general, <laughs> exercising power. There is all the difference all the difference because when you are in the academic realm you don't have power you you're not you know you're suggesting you can be very useful in helping but when you are in within the public sector with the responsibilities and you have power you have power to decide you have budgets you have institutions you have the authority and you have the power of initiative. I think that's the, entirely different. And um, this uh, is what makes uh, the merger of your academic background and your capability to, to take decisions and manage the execution within a uh, uh, a institution uh, like a bank, it could be a ministry, but within a organized institution that requires it's a different, it's entirely different uh, role and, and requires a lot of uh, of cap uh, capacity to uh, understand uh, the real world to interact with the interests, with the, uh, the, 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 the business community, this, uh, all the, 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 the interested parts in the, in the process. Mm. I, I have heard you say that arrogance is the most dangerous thing to have, that you're bound to fail if you have arrogance. So from everything you have said, one feels that you have this you consider that capacity of dealing with different people who have different experiences, different knowledge, that seems to be quite a, quite a complex role to play when you have a top job like yours, no? Yes, it is very complex. And the only way to deal with this is to open up your mind for dialogue. You need to listen uh, to all the interests. You need to business, political leaders, uh, and society, organized society, uh, labor. You got to listen to, to all the constituencies. You got to have also, not just to listen, but you must have a clear vision of your strategic goals. You need to see what I want, what the government or what this institution should uh, uh, look to and, uh, and uh, aim at. Uh, so we got to have clear objectives and we have always keep in mind uh, the public interest, uh, uh, the public value of the decisions. Uh, in the case of a bank, you should also take into account the bankability of the project. So project should be uh, sustainable, the bank should not lose money, so we should observe all the banking practices. So uh, that's uh, not need to say. So it is a complex task, task. And if you don't understand the whole uh, network of uh, pressures, of demands, of contradictions. If you don't understand, you're bound to 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 face resistance or to fail. So it is a complex task and requires also a, a political experience to deflect and to uh, aggregate 
support in one side and to avoid collisions. So it is, it is difficult, yes. Mm -hmm. So how much of what you learned in government enriched your academic work when you returned? Do, do you think current curricula in policy studies, especially innovation studies, responds to the needs of policymakers? What would you change in universities that teach how to be a policy? I mean, somehow you don't really learn how to be a policy maker. You learn how to think about policy. So how do you how do you get that going? And is it possible to change? Well. To, yeah, I, to improve education, you think? Yeah, I think in the academic uh, sphere, I think the should be more practical, more pragmatic, more policy oriented, and more aware of societal needs, of uh, social problems. Uh, should be aware also of all the vested interests behind all the issues. So we got to it to be a good economic uh, executive. You got to be also you got to be a political economist because you you need to understand uh, where the, the 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 legitimate interests are. Of business, what they wish, what what things you you cannot uh, support because they are not uh, 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 healthy or not uh, good for society or for 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 certain. Uh, so what concessions you should not make, but what other legitimate ambitions that you may support. You got to understand this, but you got to understand also the social organized society and the impact of decisions in not, ju not just in the social, which is critical, but also in the environmental area, environmental sphere. So it is a complex uh, decision, usually very complex decision making process. And you got to be aware of the uh, of the whole political uh, and uh, 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 configuration in each situation, you got to have these very clear. So uh, mm -hmm. it is, and also you got to have political support. Now you cannot lose political support because if you lose political support, you will not last long. And your policy, policy you wish to promote, may not may not last. Also, so it is it is uh, a, a necessary uh, capability that you should develop if you go to public office. Now, I would say that in government, what we need is uh, is more academic background, the better for being in government if you have the right academic background, because you need a vision, you need an understanding of the historical trends, of the, and you've got to have a theoretical basis for understanding that. So I would say that the merger of those virtues, you know, if, if people in academia could understand more how complex and how difficult it is to exercise power while you are have a position in government in one side and on the other side in being in government uh, you you should value the importance of having uh, the academic support and the academic background and how valuable that it is that is for you so i think that that's that's the point. That's the lesson I could, after being in the position for such a long time. I, we're coming to the end of our conversation. We will have questions from the audience afterwards, but I have two more questions that I want to do to give you. One is, you have played many different roles throughout your life, 
as academic professor, author of several books, top minister official, private consultancy, entrepreneur, and president of a development bank. Could you tell us which ones have given you more satisfaction and why? Well, I think my position at the bank was maybe the more uh, uh, creative and more then had a larger impact. Hmm. Even more than and then in and this, the whole science and technology policy for Brazil. No, the, the, I think the the the, the, the poli techno uh, science and technology policy was also a great achievement because the ministry exists until today. It went through ups and downs, but it is an existing institution, and I feel very proud that it is an institution that I created, I conceived yeah. from the beginning. <laughs> And then that that is an achievement and gives me. But I think my stay in the bank was very important. But I could say also, if I were not a professor, I think when now I'm back to Unica, um, I'm back to have uh, giving some classes, having some research. That is so rewarding for me that I think. I don't, I wouldn't, it's difficult to say, to answer your question, because the, the pleasure of interacting with young people. The other day I was, uh, I had to give a big lecture to, lecture to the whole Institute of Economic, new students for undergraduate courses. And it is a, a, a rewarding, a very uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, activity so i feel very uh, also so uh, um, uh, satisfied uh, in the academic uh, life that i i don't think i can divorce myself from this so this uh, it's difficult to say okay one last question if you had to share one lesson with the students one lesson that you have learned throughout which one would it be from from all your experience the current students of economics and innovation studies what what would you tell them that's the most important lesson that you have learned and that you want to share it's well, not easy i know to choose one but try well if we we're talking to economists or, or uh, professionals here related to economics, I think, um, I, for me, at least, for being an economist and not contributing to the development of the country, not thinking in, in, in policy, in engaging into, into politics and policy, development policy, it's kind of a meaningless. I think, of course, there is a large field for being an economist in um, in the private sector, working in markets, working in the financial markets, working to industrial and commercial, etc., in business, and that makes sense. But if you wish to have a public career, you got to place a very important value in your own intellectual background. You got to um, equip yourself with knowledge of class from the classical polit great political economists and, and, and historians that thought the development of capitalism, the development of societies. And that's the, 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 the never uh, you, you should. Uh, abandon these, uh, these dream. I think you should dream of contributing to society, contributing to, to your country, contributing to development. I think that's, the, that's what I can tell. Uh, if you have these uh, ambition, it's not for everyone, but if you have so, you got to place a lot of value in having this background. 
background in political economy, in sociology, in history, uh, in understanding, not just understanding uh, innovation, industry, but also understanding the society you live in. Thank you, Luciano. Wonderful. It's been really interesting. Let's pass the floor to Arthur, who's uh, your mute. Uh, yes. To, to bring in the participants. Ex exactly. We have a question in the chat uh, from Rajesh. I don't know if you want to, to unmute yourself and, and ask yourself, Rajesh. Uh, uh, thank you, Arthur. Carlotto has already asked that question. I got the answer. Oh. So, yeah. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> and congratulations. The conversation was, was was very, very interesting and useful. Thank you, Carlotta and Luciano. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. Um, well, there's one. You you kind of started to answer right at the end, uh, Luciano. Uh, you mentioned various times the importance of having a, a understanding, a theoretical background that you believe in that would support your, your actions. I wonder if you could identify some of these uh, conceptual and analytical frameworks in particular. Shall I go question by question okay i think i think it's better yeah it, it because it could shift from an area to another the, uh i understand that the question is about who would be the thinkers that that influenced his 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 performance i understood that the, the question was about identifying the 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 uh, basic uh, yes, the yes, the the theories, the 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 thinkers, the the theories that would help you uh, in, in policy making. Apart from your own, of course. <laughs> well, let's start from the classics. Now, I had the chance when I was a graduate student to spend four years reading hours every day. And I had a very generous uh, chairman of my PhD program that allowed me to organize reading lists and he would be give me the credit after I'd done the basic courses, etc. And I was very um, uh, capable in, in quantitative methods, etc. and uh, basic conventional economics. So he allowed me. Then I read a lot, but I started reading original text of Keynes, the general theory, monetary theory, uh, in order the, the historical short text of Keynes in his experience, how to pay for the war, the organizing organization of his papers for uh, the Bretton Woods conference, etc. So that's important because great uh, ideas, macro basis for macroeconomics. Then I read Schumpeter. I read The Business Cycle, very large book, spectacular. You know, this fantastic book. Sometimes I just pick it up again from my books and read because I forgot. I mean, I read it carefully. But I read other things of Schumpeter. So I think it's a basic classic author. I, I would say that you should also read uh, other. Uh, I read uh, uh, Marx, particularly the, the, the volume three of Marx, which is the most difficult, most challenging, and interesting because it's about about money and finance, very complex. And after that, I think there is a, 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 many other authors that I, I would say that are 
capital for understanding the, the world today. And I would put Minsky as a post-Keynesian. I would, I would, I have, have all, to, all other Keynesians, but I would think Minsky is the most illuminating uh, in these. I would, I would think um, of some post-Schumpeterian, new Schumpeterian, uh, that I will not mention because I think, but I, I would pinpoint Professor Freeman as one that had a lot of influence in my own formation. Um, and, and Brazilians? Brazilian uh, thinkers? And, of for course, development thinking and so on? I had the privilege to, uh, to interact in, in some period of my life with Furtado, Celso Furtado, which was a fantastic example for me because he was an academic and also was minister, minister of planning. He was the creator of, of the Brazilian regional development policy in Sudeni. So he was, uh, uh, it, it, he was the, capable of combining a great academic formation with a, a, a public role as a, as a uh, in, in public life. Uh, I th and I think uh, the, the also the tradition in Latin America of, of uh, CEPAL you know, uh, was extremely important for my own formation and particularly with Furtado. So, and I think the basics of industrial industrial organization and understanding how oligopolies work, how oligopolistic competition, how, how markets function, because mar markets do function and markets have a tremendous role, but they are not, have nothing to do with the perfect competition in textbooks. No? They're very different. Oligopolist competition could be much fiercer, fiercer and more aggressive, <laughs> as compared to to the uh, to the perfect competition uh, 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 myth uh, that has been created. So, I think that the 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 the, the basics. But on the other hand, you should understand political economy, you should have some understanding of politics. You got to, to, to have uh, basic readings in political science, in, sec in sociology. Um, and I think this border formation in social sciences are very important. A good economist, uh, policy minded should never forget history economic history it's it's fundamental to have a historical perspective to know where you are where your society is where your country is so i think this is the kind of uh, of formation that i think is fundamental to be in public office for an economist huh? besides the more technical formation huh? not that i'm I'm not saying that you no. You should be capable of also of understanding the statistics, understanding the quality of the information that comes to the statistics, understanding the the quantitative methods, such that you have a minimum basis for uh, supporting. But you should not overvalue these these uh, these. Uh, these methods, those methods should be uh, under, uh, understood uh, in its value, in, not, not in, in its uh, 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 making it upside down and putting the theory at service of, of the, the statistical findings, but on contrary wise. So I think the way is, this is what I'm, 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 I had in mind when I, I I talked about. Great, thank you. Uh, 
I have one question myself, and is it is related to to this you have mentioned because um, it takes years to build though that uh, theoretical background, and when you deal with policy making with actions in the real world not everybody will understand where it comes from. So in dealing with financing innovation and the intrinsic uncertainty uh, that's part of, of this area, what are the dangers um, related to, to, to working with, with that? Um, nowadays, uh, no, sorry, uh, not always that you'll be able to, to see concrete success in the actions, for example, of BNDS. Uh, and to show it to authorities is also not very easy. So how to deal with that? How legislation, for example, can be modified not to criminalize working with uncertainty? Well, yeah, this is an important issue because... Um, uh, we should, you know, and I forgot to say that when you are in political uh, public office, you always face resistance from uh, uh, vested interests. You face resistance from uh, the liberal mind that is moved to uh, preserve in a capitalist society and in a capitalist society in which finance has an overwhelming presence and importance, the freedom to speculate, the freedom to create and innovate in the financial area, it, it's hard to, to face. And those interests are so powerful that they promote this culture of, of uh, liberalization of everything, of containing the regulation by the state. You know? And that's why capitalism today is so uh, vulnerable to big financial crises you know? or to big over leveraging of, uh, of positions in the financial area, either over that indebtedness or over leveraging in the financial activities. So these uh, importance of this phenomenon, which is uh, obvious, it, uh, the, the, the financial wealth, globally speaking, is today six times the size of the global GDP. So we have the idea of how important this is. And those people don't like regulation at all. They would prefer to leave it. And it is understandable that they wish so. On the other hand, when they fail, the state, central banks, should bail them out, put money that, as it happened in 2008, 2009, it had just happened a few months ago uh, in Credit Suisse and uh, Silicon Valley and other banks that failed, then we still have danger of this. So this uh, liberal vision is an antagonist uh, antagonism to the uh, vision that wishes to promote development, capital, industrial capital accumulation, technical progress, and innovation with social goals. This is entirely way to to look at the at the world, and those clash of of these visions you got to be aware of how how you uh, in your uh, 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 way of uh, proposing and formulating you are capable of avoiding uh, 
um, got trapped in this clash, in this clash of visions, you know, and trying to to be capable of not just of escaping from this, but also proposing constructive uh, way out for these, for society and for government. Okay, we have a question from Pablo. Do you want to unmute Pablo? And ask yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a discrepancy here. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Luciano, Carlota, uh, Arthur. Um, so I was wondering, uh, Luciano, if you. Um, so I was thinking more about the future and like your sort of current perspectives on, um, so we were talking about the theory and a little bit of a, well, much of your sort of experience based, uh, which is very um, interesting to hear. I was wondering about like these new perspectives, perhaps that you see that, um, that you think that are useful to use this current and future sort of poverty I think mo mostly poverty issues for the future in Latin America. What is what are your thoughts on this? What do you think are key sort of ideas for addressing these future problems? I mean, I added also environmental, but I think it would be too distracting if we add that. But I think poverty would be great if you have any thoughts on that. Well, thank you for this question. I think Latin America is facing a big challenge, not just Brazil and Latin America. First, because the last nine years, we have been completing 10 years from 2014 to today. Uh, it's uh, a decade of such low growth, low capital formation in Latin America and spe especially in Brazil. Uh, this last decade is much worse than the last decade of the debt crisis from 1980 to 1990. Uh, it is, could be surprising, but uh, I think the whole development model of Latin America came into a collapse and never recovered, and we are facing a big challenge. And on the other hand, Latin America is still uh, um, muddling through a very uh, confused with a lack of a clear project for the future. And um, uh, on the other hand, Latin America, with a very few exceptions, is continued to be very vulnerable. Vulnerable to foreign exchange crisis, vulnerable to, to commodity prices cycles, etc. So um, we need to think of a with, we need to th entirely think a new perspective, a new development uh, um, model for Latin America. And I think this is the great challenge. On the other hand, now I was talking about this clash of uh, liberal uh, finance dominated vision and the other vision of uh, people that still worries with with industrial development, innovation, etc. And we have a, a, a big challenge that the climate change uh, uh, threat for the global, for, for, for the entire earth. Now, how can Latin America uh, think of a new development in which uh, the climate change and the sustainability has a, a key role for the future. Because I think Latin America has uh, uh, natural resources, biodiversity, water, um, and has other uh, uh, advantages that we should think about. Uh, which could be a new axis for a development model for Latin America. And we should think about, because I, th uh, 
uh, I think that's the, the role that a uh, it's required from 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 people from academia to propose bold, creative, and uh, uh, mobilizing new ideas for the future, uh, and that's uh, that's why I think it's in lack uh, uh, for for in our in our uh, in our profession as economists. Hey, so we are reaching out to our final moment i see a raised hand from catalina soto i think you have the privilege to ask the final question catalina oh um uh, hi hello sorry well if 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 i i can if not i can uh, of course you send can. an email later <laughs> uh well first of all thank you very much for 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 your uh presentation luciana this was um very inspiring uh the your last speech the last part of the speech uh, when when you um were inviting us to act and to follow our ambitions um so my, my question was um uh, about this clash that you were mentioning of political views for example uh in my research I have um, encountered that there is a tension between uh, um, uh, the, the clash of political views versus, for example, uh, technical decisions in an entrepreneurial ecosystems of a city in Colombia. And uh, this actually, this tension mediates and, and affects and makes the, the whole Co collective agency of the actors makes it so fragile that is is almost always breaking up due to this political um, tension or, or this political way of of doing of taking the decisions. So I just was I, I just I was wondering now as as maybe citizen, <laughs> not as as a researcher, like from your experience. You, you were talking about, uh, for example, arrogance, or you were talking about egos uh, breaking the relationships. Um, what would you, uh, how, or what capacities or capabilities you detected in your work, in your experience that were able to mediate this, this clash that of, of, of political tensions that um, in, in the case of this city is always uh, breaking up things like um, maybe, um, <laughs> you have some insights uh, on it. Yes, I, I think uh, I was giving a very broad um, um, perspective. And I think we should go into, uh, because I, the way you understand this threat of climate change, change is so dramatic that if even the big financial uh, interests and starts to understand that uh, this is an area in which regulations, state policies, uh, in which markets are not capable of dealing. No. It is not just a, a lack of uh, uh, market forces and, and failure of markets, because in these, uh, it's such a a, a tremendous uh, challenge to face that it does require uh, uh, systemic and but those systemic policies must be concrete and should embrace all the activities from the agriculture mining industry everyone must decarbonize so there is a big challenge to decarbonization but this is not just a simple mantra it is mean technologies should be developed for this. new forms of energy new bioprocesses new forms of capturing uh, 
carbon or methane, etc. All those requires requires policies, requires uh, technical and scientific development that must be accelerated to face the challenges. So either we are capable of proposing so solutions for these. And that would require us to, uh, let's say, uh, be, be able to, to specify uh, programs, either mission-oriented programs, but, and you will have uh, Mariana coming next uh, to discuss these, or specific uh, strategic technologies that must be developed. I think also the pandemic left us interesting lessons. Now, the, the pandemic made such an impact, overwhelming impact in society that, that it was unconceivable before. So we should think about how uh, public uh, health should be cared for uh, and what are the minimum uh, requisites and minimum uh, uh, requirements for for sanitary security for societies so and what are the implications of these regarding policies so i think we should renew our um, uh, we think we need to renew our way of thinking in proposing policies, in proposing industrial and, and technology policies for the future. But we must prove in a very clear way that they are essential to the future of societies, to the well being of societies. That's the only way to overcome the clash of visions, because this clash of visions paralyzes us. And we, we, we cannot let us be uh, paralyzed in our way of uh, cap cap capability to formulate alternatives. That's what I, I was trying to say. Thank you, Luciano, for a very interesting session about your experience and for closing it with the two huge challenges that we have, because development is now about sustainability, both socially and environmentally. So it's a double challenge that's enormous. And all these young people and all the ones that will watch this session afterwards when we have it recorded in uh, the YSI page and the and then the Lalix page, Globelix Lalix, uh, will benefit enormously from from your experience that you've shared with us. So thank you very much, Arthur. You can close now, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Luciano, Carlotta, and all the participants. And stay tuned, register, so you get to uh, be part of our next events as well.